Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining us all. Um, I'll, I'll start it off. My name's Itzel Torres, and I'm with 3C Run working out of Ventura County. Before we get started on our higher performance envelope and balance ventilation with our instructors today, Jennifer Rennick and Andy, um, I'd like to go through some housekeeping slides about who we are for people who are new to our network. Um, if, if you're new, welcome again. Um, we are the Tri-County Regional Energy Network, aka 3C Run. It's a collaborative partnership between San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara counties, and Ventura. Um, we work on improving energy efficiency in our region and offering free programs and services for all building professionals. We currently have three programs, our Energy Code Connect, Building Performance Training, and Home Energy Savings. Next slide, please. Energy Code Connect offers three distinctive services, which are the Energy Code Coach, uh, which is an over the phone, online and over the counter, and in the field Title 24 consultation service to help professionals navigate the California Energy Code. Trainings that focus on increasing overall energy code comprehension, compliance and enforcement and regional forums. Next slide, please. Um, our building performance training program is the one in which we are offering this training today. Um, we offer technical skills related to building science principles and systems for high performance buildings, as well as soft skill trainings, as, such as sales, marketing, and communication techniques in order to grow businesses and start um, your career. Uh, next slide, please. Our home energy savings program, we reach, recently have relaunched our multifamily program, um, which includes rebates up to $750 for apartments, plus additional rebates for specialty measures. Um, we are working on relaunching our single family program, so stay tuned to that. But in the meantime, you could um, check out a DUI home energy savings toolkit in our county libraries to learn more about what you could currently do in your home to start doing some upgrades. And it's just a really fun interactive thing to do also with, you know, if any of you have kids or just to, to learn a little bit more about that. So I really encourage you to go out and, and look at those a little bit more in, in depth. But without further ado, um, I'll hand it back to Michelle to, to introduce our instructors and tell you a little bit more about our learning objectives today. Thanks so much, Itzel. Um, it's wonderful to be here with everyone today. Um, today's program is higher performance um, building with a focus on envelope and ventilation. Um, as Itzel mentioned, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'll introduce myself. My name is Michelle Zimney. Uh, I'm a senior sustainability consultant with Inbalance Green Consulting. And our instructors today um, are Jennifer Rennick, uh, certified energy analyst, as well as Andy Pease, who will be joining us momentarily. Um, together, they'll be uh, presenting today's um, on today's topic. I will be moderating, um, which means I'll be sort of um, keeping time and collecting questions. Um, if something seems really urgent, I will go ahead and jump in um, to the program and, and offer the question, or if you want to elaborate, you'll feel free. We also have time scheduled at the end um, to allow folks to develop their questions and have a, a freer discussion. Um, and next slide, please. Oops. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over. Oh, do you want me to do the learning objectives, Jen? Sure. <laughs> okay, learning objectives for today. There are AIA credits available. Um, um, so we'll be uh, looking, I can read them for you, uh, at thermal bridging and air movement and the impacts on energy performance, um, looking at the application and benefits of rain screens, especially in our central coast climate. Um, we want to help you understand options for insulation and air and vapor barriers, uh, as well as best practices for each. And we'll help you identify balanced ventilation strategies and the costs and benefits of each. I see already in the chat that we do have um, some building science uh, specialists, um, folks thinking about decarbonizing the built environment um, and generally sustainable infrastructure. Um, if you could go ahead and add your, um, your bio info or any um, questions you have to the chat as we go, um, we would most appreciate it. 
Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Jen. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Um, let's see. Uh, in addition to an energy uh, analyst, I'm also a licensed architect as Andy Pease is. And I know some of you might have expected um, Mike, who's part of our group, to be on the uh, to be on the call today. But um, we've had to shuffle our um, shuffle our resources around. So um, basically, I'm going to take over some of the stuff Mike was doing. Andy's going to take over some of the stuff I was doing. But nonetheless, I noticed we have some other people from our our group on the call, so we'll be able to get all your questions answered. Uh, we're going to mostly focus on the new homes and retrofits, and um, a little bit of this will also pertain to non-res construction. We're going to cover, like uh, Michelle mentioned, the exterior envelope first, then go into ventilation. We're going to talk a little bit about thermal applications, bulk water removal, and moisture and air barriers. And then on the ventilation system, we're gonna hit on the importance of air changes and different types of ventilation systems. And uh, the ventilation, we're mostly addressing residential construction on that part of it. The reason we are calling this higher performance buildings of today is that there's, in California, we have a fairly mild climate compared to the rest of the country. And we know that if we just do a little bit more to our buildings with the way our energy code is, is in place, that we will get higher performance out of our buildings, which will be appropriate and cost effective for our climate zone. And the reason to do that is you're going to have lower energy bills, you're going to have virtually no moisture problems, consistent comfort throughout. Um, the buildings are going to be healthy interiors, healthier for the environment, and more resilient. So again, broadly speaking, we're going to be focusing mostly on the Central Coast Tri-County region, being part of the 3C REN. And so a lot of the things we're talking about could be applicable to a lot of the other climate zones, but we have a special focus for our Tri-County region today. And in the past, on some of the other classes in this series, uh, you may have seen this sort of what we call Wheel of Fortune. It does also follow closely with Passive House, where we talk about thermal uh, bridge-free construction, uh, balanced ventilation using mechanical balanced ventilation, quality insulation, uh, strategic window placement, minimize air leakage. And today, when we talk about the envelope ventilation, it really, it's gonna pertain to um, almost the entire wheel. And that we do do a class that specifically deals with the windows and glazing, which picks up that other part of the puzzle, other part of the wheel there. Okay, and the envelope, please. That's Andy's joke, by the way. She, she likes those award shows on TV. <laughs> okay, so one of the things we are trying to get the architects to really look at and builders as well is the envelope and thinking of the building envelope, the walls, the roofs, the floors, the slabs, the ceilings, where do all of those things have continuity and where do they intersect and connect and how do we create a envelope, a whole envelope that is clearly and continuously cohesive in terms of bulk water removal, thermal um, resistance, and moisture and air barrier protection. And so this diagram is, we call it the red line tests. And what we like to do is take our projects and see if we can't draw a continuous red line around the whole envelope and see that these systems uh, are in fact connected. And when it comes to bulk water removal, 
um, you know, just kind of right off the bat, at a very minimum, our buildings were meant to shed bulk water or, you know, at least stay above the bulk water in the case of uh, places that are coastal or near, near Great Lakes. And shedding bulk water is still a tenant of good construction, but there's room for improvement and there's ways to take some of our buildings in California that have been prone to some moisture issues and improve how we work on those assemblies, those especially our wall assemblies. Now, for the thermal aspect of it, we, our thermal envelope at a minimum is meant to keep us warm in the winter and cool in the summer, but mostly it was meant to keep us warm in the winter. And we expect nowadays our buildings to keep us comfortable, but there's always a question that comes up like where should the insulation go and what type, and depending on the type, where should the insulation go? I think this website, uh, energy.gov, energy saver, I think this diagram is, is really useful. It's from our, it's from the DOE website. And what I would just add to this is, um, you know, this is my author's note commentary is to consider taking that insulation, that envelope all the way to the very edges and create perhaps high performance attic conditions attics. Now, when it comes to air and moisture, our envelope also is expected, or the building assemblies are also expected to protect us from water and moisture, be more resilient, more durable, um, and air sealing should be a part of it. Now, it's kind of interesting in the energy code, air sealing and um, sealing penetrations is required but a blower door test currently is not required. Um, so there isn't a good way to test it, but the California Energy Commission, the way the code's been going is they're stepwising all of California towards a more efficient envelope that will include more blower door testing to see if we really did in fact seal all the penetrations in the envelope and keep the outside out and keep the inside in as a, uh, a well-known building scientist that I know likes to, to say all the time. Um, again, another diagram from the website. What I would add to their diagram is moisture protection at the foundation and at the slab on grade and the basement level. Um, there's a lot of membranes that can help do this, including air barriers, vapor barriers, you know, a lot of folks in our area use Tyvek as their house wrap. There's a lot of ways to do it. We can make capillary breaks in the concrete slab. We can use a special uh, liquid membranes on the outside of the foundation walls before we backfill it. There's a number of things that can be done. So I just add that to your list to make sure it's part of your continuous red line around your envelope. And when it comes to the house design and looking at that red line kind of work, we're gonna use a house that uh, Mike uh, Horgan built and he was intimately involved with the design and this is an image of it. And when we take a simple section through the entryway of this project, we had, did our best to overlay a red line and what that red line would look like. So we know that the, the junctures at the roof to wall, there's continuous uh, membrane there and it goes into a rain screen. And we paid attention at the bottom of the windows and we've paid attention to what happens at that foundation and make sure that membrane is under the slab and is continuously in connection with the rest of the structure or at least um, all the parts and pieces come together in a way that there's very little separation and gaps. And we're gonna start with the foundation and up. And so this next image here is a picture of, of the site of that house. And one of the basic things you could do 
for moisture mitigation is to stop the moisture from the ground to get into your house, just stop it in the first place before it ever has a chance to get into there. We're a big fan of Stego uh, 15 mil vapor barrier. There's other products out there. This just happens to be one that's readily available in our area. And uh, they, you know, the sales folks here have made it a point to make it easy to work with them in our area, but there are other products out there. Now, interestingly, this project uses a product called Glavel and it has an insulative quality. So this was actually a cost savings. A lot of times the projects Mike's designs, they might've had a rigid insulation under the slab, but in this particular case, he was able to use the gravel and save the cost of the rigid insulation and still get an insulative quality out of his aggregate. And it is made up of uh, recycled glass. So it looks great, it compacts, uh, in place really well, but it has a really high insulative quality and gives everything that uh, capillary breaks as well as then you can put the stego right on the top of the gravel and you can seal the stego to the foundation. You can use special tapes. You can run that stego underneath the footing if for the particular detail you're doing. And um, it's really the first step in a slab on grade making a vapor barrier an airtight house. This is another picture of that. Um, you can see where the, the red is where the stego sheets have been seam sealed to make a continuous barrier. And then after the rebar is placed, the concrete goes directly on it. No sand. Okay, I'm going to go back to this picture. The reason I bring this up is this is a detail of what we recommend. And there is no sand in this detail. We don't have our vapor barrier cush cushioned into four inches of sand. The California or um, American Concrete Association, all the top um, like building science folks, none of them are recommending that we throw sand on top of Visqueen as an appropriate way to provide lasting thermal break or lasting capillary break in the slab. So we recommend this kind of a kind of a method, and the concrete is poured. Um, you know, is poured directly onto the stego wrap. I mean, onto the stego membrane. Okay, and oh, I forgot to mention, while um, I'm going, if there are questions and you guys or comments or anything, um, this is very, it's supposed to be interactive in that sense. So uh, Michelle's gonna monitor the chat. And if there is something that comes up about anything I'm saying, Michelle, just let me know so that we can address the question as we go. Here's another way that you can provide that airtight um, foundation to wall connection. This detail that's um, in the area that's green, that is the detail that we used on the Robinson house and the membrane is actually adhered to the stem wall, the outside perimeter of the concrete to protect the sheathing, the plywood sheathing and the sill plate. And that membrane is attached. We've got some other videos where we show that and what happens there. Um, Mike's, I've been inside and Mike went outside with a leaf blower and blew lots of air on there. And there was nothing coming into the house. And when Mike has done the blower door test on this, the house is sealed very well. But this, this part of the detail of getting that membrane sealed to the foundation is one way to do it that works really great. Um, all the DuPont Tyvek 
products. They've got their whole line now too. And those other two images on the right are from another project we worked on. And there's the, in one case, it was a liquid um, membrane that did the same thing. Notice that it's on the OSB plywood, or it's not plywood in this case, but the OSB sheathing. And it laps that down to the stem wall and same with the, um, you know, the flexible tape that they offer. And there's, again, there's other products out there, but this is the beginning to, to starting our uh, rain screen assembly is to get a good seal at the bottom of, of the wall. And then when it comes to these rain screens, rain screen really, it's, um, it's becoming a more popular use term. And in my mind, how I really think about it is a rain screen is just, we've taken our exterior siding, whether it's stucco or wood or cement board and stone, brick even, whatever that siding is, we've taken it and we pulled it away slightly from the rest of the wall. And that is now a rain screen. So instead of having all those materials right touching, right onto your house wrap or onto your uh, sheathing, it's now spaced out a little bit with strips of wood, in some cases strips of plastic, like as in Coravent, and that provides a capillary break. It provides a space behind the siding material so that it can dry out. And it also stops um, any of the siding if it's wet with water to push onto your house, the sheathing or the membranes and through um, pressure, through water pressure, it won't penetrate into that space anymore. So it stops that, or at least now, it's got another little strip, you know, at very few places along the wall, there's a strip where things touch, but the bulk of it now can dry out. So this, this shows um, a, a mock-up that we like to build on sites. That's the left, we'll do a full scale mock-up. And in this case, for this particular project, we used Adhero uh, self-adhering membrane, and it is adhered, in this case, directly to a plywood sheathing. And then over the plywood sheathing, we have our continuous insulation. And the, the cavity of the wall is filled with insulation as well. So that then we have continuous insulation to the exterior. In this case, it's a product called Gutex and it's a wood fiber product. And then on top of that, we can use a variety of things to kind of bump up, give that airspace for our sheathing or our siding rather. And in this case, it's just ripped pieces of plywood. So three eighths inch plywood is fine. You can rip that into one and a half inch wide strips and attach that through the, through the insulation and into the wood studs. And then your siding can be attached to the furring strips. And so it's a fairly uh, straightforward process. Hey, Jennifer. Yeah. Hi. Um, hey, I th hi, thanks for, uh, thanks for getting everything rolling while I could uh, uh, join in here. I just wanted to throw in also, because I know if Mike were here, he would note that in this mock-up that the actual siding there um, that the, it's just kind of a placeholder and that the actual siding they used was more of a shiplap um, again, for the, the positive drainage, but this was just kind of boards as a sample. Um, but it was really uh, helpful for all of the sub, all of the uh, sub trades to be able to see the mock-up and know how each of their pieces fit into the hole as it went. So uh, if you're, especially if you're trying to do something even a little bit different than standard, having a mock-up that lives on site has been really helpful. Yes, you're right. He, he would have reminded us all of that. That's great, thank you. That is so true. Um, so more thermal considerations. So wall cavity, exterior continuous insulation, it's both. It's not wall, when we're doing these higher performance projects, we're not doing wall cavity or exterior. We're usually doing wall cavity 
and exterior rigid or exterior continuous insulation. And what we recommend to the architects is that they go ahead and in, do a larger detail of that foundation to wall area and really kind of spell out what that whole wall assembly is going to be as part of that detail. And I know, you know, being a licensed architect, I know that we're used to seeing like structural engineered our details from the engineer that oftentimes doesn't address any of the insulation, but just has our nailing for our plywood sheathing or OSB sheathing and a connection to the foundation, the plate. But if you work with your structural engineer, you can improve those details. You can also coordinate a little better with those details. And in this case, for this particular building, it was perfectly fine with the engineer that we did a two pour system so that our stego wrap actually went completely under the slab and capped the top of the footing. And then the attachments and everything happened. So it's depending on the project, work with your engineer and you can improve some of the thermal and moisture uh, details. So that's one thing we recommend. And then the other is there's a lot of great online resources, including this one, 475. Um, there's other ones out there, but this just gives a really good example of a three dimensional drawing that you could do for your builders and for the other people in your, out there that aren't familiar with this way of building so that they can better see it and understand that sometimes when they're looking at a two-dimensional flat thing, it's really hard to know what the rain screen really is all about. But somehow when you put it into a three-dimensional form, if you can't do a full mock-up, it seems to make a lot more sense how the layers of product are going. And in this case, particular case, it was from a, an existing house. So that's why there's the diagonal um, sheathing instead of uh, plywood, but same, same concepts. Jen, if I could jump in yeah. here, we've got a question that's really relevant to this idea of insulating the cavity and the exteriors. Um, yes. Cora is um, asking if you have any recommendations uh, for natural insulation products. And I know we were showing Gutex, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. She was specifically thinking about hemp-based materials. I don't, uh... Well, I don't know. I don't have a good resource for hemp-based materials. I, I know there's a product out there, hempcrete, but I don't know if hemp is being used in a blanket form or like it is with um, sheep wool you can use, or like in this, the image down in the bottom left corner is using uh, rock wool insulation. Um, yeah, I don't know specifically for that, but I'd certainly be interested to, to learn about it, learn more about it. Um, anyone feel free to put it in the chat if you have a inside line on that. Um, otherwise, if you want to, if you're trying to get away from uh, foam or trying to use products that have a lower global warming potential, um, you can, there's, there is Gutex and there's going to be a manufacturer in California here pretty soon. Mike was telling me that's going to be offering a similar product in our area. So keep your eyes open for that. And then there is the, um, um, cellulose for cavity insulation. So the bottom left one, rock wool has if you go to their website, they're gonna give you a lot of the details already and some of the fastening details on how to use their product as a continuous exterior insulation included with the rain screen. Um, there's MTI Dry that has, a, has a, a whole line of products that are used to help with the bulk water over the tops of the windows and around the windows and um, roof to wall flashings. 
that can help with some of those bulk water removals and kind of help you detail how to interface your rain screen to the windows and to the tops of the walls and the bottom of the walls. And same with core event, same with all the Dorkin products. And I think now more and more, each of these companies is starting to put together whole packages of ways to show the architects and the builders how they can do the continuous insulation, rain screen, cavity filled insulation product. It's really the way the whole industry is going. And just about every manufacturer you can think of is offering up their details now for all of us to use. And I should note, Jen, uh, we've got a great crowdsourcing going on here. Uh, folks, <laughs> if you haven't opened your chat window, please do. Um, every, we got some great experts on, on the call here um, offering their ideas for maybe a hemp wool or cork. Um, and so please do. Uh, right. Oh, I, yes. I, I that's right. interrupt all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. OK. I, yeah, I forgot about cork. And um, so. And there's more products than we can really address here. So this, in some ways, is to kind of give you guys an idea, kind of point folks in the right direction, and to let you know that there's some really good resources out there now. Really good resources. Um, yeah, back to the air leakage and the air infiltration. Yes, it's, it's part of the code that we're not supposed to have air leakage, and we're supposed to air seal and um, make sure a lot of that is taken care of. Now, the window manufacturer themselves takes care of part of the code. And then the other half of this air leakage code really comes down to the builder. And it's gonna be, mm, let's say harder, easier for the builder if, harder for the builder if none of the details in the architect's drawings address the air barrier and air leakage issues. Um, however, the builder in the end is going to be responsible for this part. And that's why the blower door test is so important as a way to make sure that, that all that air leakage was taken care of. Now, when it comes to looking at your attic situation for a higher performance building, you can have an, you could choose to do an attic or no attic. It could be a vented attic or an unvented attic. There's, um, you know, like Mike likes to say, there's a hundred different ways you could create a higher performance house and choosing these different ways to do the assembly. For today, we're just going to show you what was done on this house, which is, um, uh, and then I'll show you a couple drawings in a few more slides of what you could do also on different different houses. So this is a no attic vented roof assembly. And what I mean by that is, and I'll show you in the next slide. First, I'm going to hit the air tightness problem areas. So typically you're you're doing the building the house wrap on your walls. And what we see a lot is that at the top of the wall, there's no continuity with any kind of an air barrier uh, wrap for the roof. And so what Mike did on this project is he took that air barrier that's being used for the roof, wraps it, laps it down over the walls and make sure that it's put together. So there's, um, there's uh, sequencing that has to be thought through. And he likes to say on this particular project, he was so happy with the folks working on the house because he had done the full scale mock up. He had shown him a drawing and talked about it. And they really, they got it once they could see it and kind of visualize it in 3D. And then he came out there and they were already just putting it together just the way he wanted it. Um, with this house, same house. Now here's a view at the top. There's two by sleepers that are run on top of the rafters. So this flexible open membrane acts as air barrier, but it lets moisture out. So if moisture does get up into the roof assembly, into the ceiling, rather, that cavity assembly, that moisture can get out through the membrane and then travel along an airflow path that 
has been now created by those sleepers. So the air, any moisture can travel through along here and then work its way up and out those vents. So this is what it's looking like from underneath and the top. And you know, here's a detail for you all to um, have as a conceptualization of what of what we're talking about. Now, for other uh, like an unvented. Uh, roof assembly and unvented attic assemblies. It's pretty common, and you see this too in the code of in our mm, energy code, the manual. They'll show examples of what a high performance attic could be, and these are three ways it could be done. The one thing we notice a lot is that when we have this portion the of our assembly, often this piece is left off when it comes to being insulated. So when it's really compact like this, it's pretty easy. You can see the rigid foam. I mean, the spray foam is sprayed in there. It does a pretty good job of sealing on the edges. But if you are going to do this, put in your details that you want this to be to be insulated with the rigid insulation, because this part, this knee wall, on those attics is actually part of the assembly. And we see that missed a lot. Okay, real last, last thought is the idea of skewers, thermal skewers through the envelope. So let's say we've gone through all the trouble of designing this house or designing the multi-story building and we've done our red line through everything and we think we've got a good connection roof to wall wall to foundation around the windows but now we need a balcony or now we need the deck and so um, I want you to think about that for residential construction consider like in this little diagram shows consider bringing the weight and support of the deck maybe completely outside the envelope and then strategically attaching it to the house to minimize thermal bridging. But for your larger, you know, large scale projects there and projects that you steal, there are a couple of product lines out there that make special materials that can stop the thermal bridging between the either concrete components or the steel components. And I put a couple websites there. You guys are going to get a copy of all this so that you can go and look up these products. And just, I want to put it in your mind that, that there is a way to do this and stop the thermal bridging. Even for, this one is a roof, even for mounting the mechanical equipment on the roof, you can isolate them and stop those elements from causing thermal bridging. And then just before I hand it off to Andy, uh, last but not least, when you're uh, looking at parapets, just keep all these principles in mind because a lot of times parapets are notorious for allowing the air leakage to come up through the ceiling assembly and bypass any sort of non-existent air barrier in here. Plus there's hardly insulation in the parapets and these become uh, places where water and moisture can collect. It's cold at the parapet, it condenses and those almost always are the first place for uh, structural failure. And so with that, I am gonna let Andy jump in and she's gonna talk to us about ventilation and the importance of ventilation. Because once we have that tight envelope, we need fresh air inside the building that's controlled on our terms, on the engineer and the architects, you know, the designers and the homeowners terms, not just willy nilly through all the uh, cracks in the building. Okay, Andy. Awesome, thank you so much. And thanks um, for the um, great um, overview of all the tight envelope that's needed and exactly right. So that's why we put these two together is that you can't have a, a tight home and not be thoughtful about the ventilation. Um, and so that's what we're, uh, that for health and for the code we're gonna be wanting to talk about. 
Um, so we need fresh air, right? And the best way to do that is to open. Uh, the reason for the fresh air is because we have all these materials inside our homes that off gas. And whether it's uh, new furniture or cleaning things, combustion gases from cooking, and of course, airborne infection. So we need this fresh air for sure. And the great way to provide that fresh air is honestly an open window. So if there are times of the year where you have the, um, the conditions are right for an open window, uh, perfect, do that. Uh, we wanna make sure that you have cross breeze and you design for that cross ventilation. But we have the rest of the times when it doesn't make sense. You have the heater on or the air conditioning or you're doing passive heating and cooling. And so you have the overnight um uh lows to get your house cool and you want to keep it that way or if the air quality is bad i mean we certainly have had some really uh, gnarly days out there for that so you want uh mechanical ventilation and by code you need uh mechanical ventilation so that's where we're going to um, be talking about um but but uh windows open windows are still a good solution on the right days so for the um the key requirements by code for ventilation are the mechanical ventilation system shall be provided, right? So this is not a choice. This is uh, used to be kind of a bonus, but they'd rely on the leaky houses. Um, we'll focus on that mechanical ventilation, but just as a reminder, you still are required to have local exhaust for um, the kitchen and the bathroom, an outside vent for the dryer, unless it's non-combustion. Um, see our other topics about all electric construction, um, and then lots of other details in terms of verification labeling. And then in terms of that mechanical ventilation, there's just a few options. So you have the exhaust only or the supply only kind of fans. Um, you can have a central fan, a fan integrated system. That's like if you have a furnace um, and then balanced with or without heat recovery. So there's uh, three different fans. We're gonna start with this one because often we get a lot of confusion when people talk about fans. So uh, mostly we're focused here on an exhaust fan. Um, well, we're looking at these kind of three different types, right? So an exhaust fan is typically local for a kitchen or a bathroom. Um, a whole house fan is by what we mean by that is one of these um, kind of short-term use that's an, an attic fan or exhaust heat and you open up for a couple hours in, uh, or half an hour in the afternoon to exhaust that um, warm stale air or whole house ventilation. And so that's the one that we're talking about. It's balanced and you can have it with or without heat recovery uh, ventilators. So in an exhaust only system or supply only, which is unfortunately what we see uh, a lot of, where uh, we have a fan and it's just exhausting air. And so then the air is being pulled through wherever it happens to pull from, right? So um, uh, in this case, the um, uh, could pull from the outside. It could pull from crawl space if you had it. And, and it's allowed by code. So you can, you can do that um, by Cal Green and the energy code. Uh, the bathroom fan has to have a humidistat, but otherwise uh, it's kind of continuously running at a very low speed and you can't really even hear it. There's requirements that has to be quiet. And, um, and so if you have a leaky house and, you know, and you're not so worried about it, uh, then that's okay. It's, it's definitely not our preference, but it's still something that we see a lot of. Um, and then the next one is this, which we not can see a whole lot, but the central fan integrated uh, system. So this is like if you have a furnace and you're, um, and it's ducted and then there's a fan only kind of option. But the thing is, is that you have to have pretty sophisticated controls in order to, um, over the course of a three hour period, get the air changes that you need. You can't just leave it continuously running because um, that's not energy efficient. So um, in theory, you can use this, but it's, uh, it's not what we're seeing. And then within the balanced ventilation, there are a couple of options. So this is uh, certainly better than just an exhaust or supply only. And in this one, we're bringing in um, outside air and we're exhausting so that you get that balance. Uh, lots of off the shelf uh, products that are available on, um, on this type of option as well. And then we go on to kind of a better system, which is when you have a 
a balanced system like that, but with heat recovery. So you're basically running the outside air through, it's almost like a radiator with a bunch of fins inside. And so it's exhausting the cool air and bringing in the warm air, for example. And, um, and then they, uh, they don't actually mix the air. They just kind of run across the fins to be able to adjust the temperature. So again, off the product, off the shelf products available um, for this one. And so these heat recovery ventilators, there's kind of like a, they still look just like a box um, and the fresh air intake and the exhaust. And then in terms of the temperatures that you'll see on the next slide is um, that um, they're pretty effective, right? Uh, they vary in, um, in how much they are, but if you're taking in, uh, if it's super cold outside and you're exhausting 70 degree air, you don't wanna bring in zero degree air. So as it passes through the coils, it's gonna pick up to just below room temperature. So it's very energy efficient that way. Um, and so, uh, so I see somebody asking, what, what's the advantage of balanced ventilation without heat recovery? And that's more of an indoor air quality issue. So if you're in super mild climates and you're not as concerned about the actual uh, thermal control, a balanced ventilation at least still gets you um, the kind of control that it's going through a filter rather than just like, <laughs> where am I gonna find air from wherever crack um, that I happen to that's going through a wall cavity and maybe there's moisture, et cetera. So, um, okay, and then here's uh, just some uh, visuals of balanced ventilation. Uh, this is uh, the uh, a Zender system. There's a couple slides here and that's, they're just like little three inch ducts that run through. There's maybe one unit in the garage and uh, super easy to install. And the beauty of this also is that then you can just use one like heat pump, even if you have a really um, a well sealed house that's not too huge. You can do one or two of the actual heat pumps for uh, heating and cooling, and then rely on the ducted system to be able to distribute the air so you don't have to have a whole bunch of heads all over the house. You can also do an even simpler system, this Lunos heat recovery. It's just like the size of a coffee can and it comes in pairs and you put one on one side of the house and one or room and, um, and they cycle on. There's a filter in there, there's a heat recovery in there and, um, and then they will, um, sorry, my cat uh, is as always is on um, the camera here. And so uh, these little units will just kind of, uh, again, quietly cycle either direction. And then there's a, a panic, Panasonic um, uh, ERV uh, kind of example that just tucks into the ceiling. So how much air is needed? There's a pretty straightforward formula um, to be able to plug in with a floor, floor area and the number of bedrooms. And just as an example, here's for a small one bedroom, you might only need 39 CFM. And for a bigger house with multiple bedrooms, maybe it's 110. And so um, the, um, uh, your Title 24 performance um, uh, approach, uh, Title 24 report will tell you um, how many CFM you need, but this is also kind of a, a relatively quick um, uh, little formula. And then, um, and then you are allowed to have a switch for this uh, ventilation. So this is what's required, but you can have a switch if it's labeled, there's pretty specific work wording in, um, in the, in the code that says, um, next to the switch, it's supposed to say, uh, leave on when the building is closed, or this is required for air changes or something like that. But if the air quality is lousy outside or it's the summer and you have all your windows open anyway, you can turn off your fan. So that is allowed because um, I know people get frustrated frustrated about that. So, OK, so in terms of what does that size mean, here's like a, a Whisper Comfort uh, uh, HRV uh, balanced ventilation unit. And you kind of go to that um, uh, spec sheet and you can see there's a 40 CFM, a 20 CFM, a 10 CFM unit. And so knowing the size of the home and the number of bedrooms, you can calculate what size you need and, um, and be able to um, get the uh, number of units if you need multiple ones. 
Um, and then down at the bottom here, there talks about 66% efficiency or effectiveness for heating and cooling. And so that's something you need to be really thoughtful about. You can get a really great energy savings with a very efficient um, heat recovery ventilator, but some of them are really bad. And so you need to make sure that your Title 24 report is reflecting what you're actually building, that you're neither getting too big of a credit or not enough credit for this um, recovery ventilation. And here's just a sample layout for um, if you're looking at a ducted system like a Zender so that you can see the blue is supply air and red is the return air and they, you know, there's kind of larger units and they go to a manifold and, and slip into the spaces and then there's just kind of a little diagram of what it looks like in the field. So um, on a bigger house, these are just a, a great device to, to go with. And then kind of wrapping up is that there are uh, resources um, to make sure that if you are using um, these um, HRV products in particular, that you um, um, make sure that they're certified. Um, there's a product directory here. Um, and Jennifer, I don't know if you wanna to touch on this as a, as a resource and, and how, how folks kind of use this um, uh, resource. Yeah, I'm muted though. Thank you for reminding me about <laughs> that. Yeah, um, both as like certified energy analysts doing Title 24 calcs, also architects hat, you know, both of them. It's like what I notice on the ventilation heat recovery is a lot of times the the architects will know that we need some kind of heat recovery. So I do think it's our ventilation. So I think that the calculation is important that Andy showed. And it helps with like choosing these Panasonic units or choosing other units because you're going to see them in the ceiling. You'll notice them. And passing that information on to your Title 24 person, because unfortunately, what we have seen is some of the Title 24 consultants will put in a product that's nearly impossible to obtain and has such high efficiency that um, the product may not be as simple as when you put in the ceiling, which is what the architect was thinking and is what the space was designed for and what the builder was hoping to put in. But we've seen it where the energy consultant has said, oh, well, you need a better energy savings and doesn't really uh, broach the subject with the team, but throws in like a Renzar or a Zender system with super high efficiency. And it either doesn't meet the budget or it's faked in a little bit or the homeowner and the architect are completely shocked now that a product like that is required. And if they don't, aren't able to put in a ducted system like the Renzar or the uh, Zender, then they're back to redesign on some of the envelope or some other um, heating and cooling system to make up the difference. So I would like to see the architects embrace the ventilation aspect a little bit more completely and not just leave it up to the consultant or the builder to figure it out on the fly. Because I think um, as the energy code gets tighter, that'll have an impact on the actual design of the project and really impact the architect and their relationship with the homeowner. <laughs> I don't know, maybe that was a long-winded way to say that, but <laughs> for all the good. architects listening, like go check this website out, just read over the products, you know? get familiar with them great uh okay and i think that's uh bringing us near the end uh we're ready for questions and discussions i know uh, michelle has to jump off but we have um i think we should just go ahead and stop doing oh actually let's um just because if people do need to drop off i do want to make sure that we run through the um the 3c ran just so that people know to uh look ahead so Jennifer, can you show that? And then we'll circle back to uh, discussion. Yeah, 
Okay, thank you so much, Andy. Um, I'll go ahead and jump in really quickly and hand it off to y'all for questions. Um, as I'm rolling through, if everybody could please just take this poll, we really appreciate all the feedback we get from you all to inform our, our training. So without further ado, um, this training has 1.25 um, health and safety and welfare AIA learning units. So if you have any questions about units, please feel free to contact me directly. I'll put my email in there or about any sort of certificates of completion or attendance, I could go ahead and send you those. Um, I've already marked a couple people down on this training to send you that all. Um, we also do have a follow-up email that will include today's recording. Um, send, send out your way. So also be in the lookout for that and just some upcoming courses um, that 3C Ren is, is hosting in the next month or so. So we have the National Association for Realtors and Green Designation, Minimizing Embodied Carbon by Design, our 2022 Energy Code Preview for Single Family Projects, Green Real Estate Marketing, All Electric Building Stories from the Field, which is gonna be with this, these amazing instructors in balance. Again, um, looking forward to that one. Um, our 2022 energy code preview for non-residential projects, our BPI certificate, healthy housing principles for contractors and HVAC design for code officials. Um, I'll go ahead and also input the link to view more learning objectives and descriptions on those courses. So please feel free to um, go, go look on that. And yeah, well, that, that's it for me. Thank you again. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to email me directly or go to our info at 3crun.org email as well. Send questions through there and just visit our website. Looking forward to seeing you all again. Thank you. I'll hand it off back to questions. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Itzel. We really enjoy the um, partnership with 3C RAN and the variety of courses that they've been uh, able to offer. So it's great to teach some, but also great to attend some. I'm looking forward to, uh, to some of these that are coming up. Um, if you need to jump off, we understand, um, but we're going to go ahead and stay on and then hopefully open up um, some folks, let some folks unmute and, and talk about uh, there is uh, some great uh, conversations going on. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to stop share and let's uh, let folks uh, be able to uh, chime in on either with questions or comments? Awesome. So um, I did see, so there was again some more um, conversations, uh, feedback about um, envelope, I mean about insulation, and then um, and then I wonder, uh, Jason had a couple of comments in here, and I don't know if you, there's something that you want to chime in on to be able to share. And then um, looks like uh, Judy might want to chime in. So I think this is just a great time to um, uh, unmute, turn on your cameras, and let the, the building science uh, practical implementation uh, go ahead. Hey, guys, it's Jason Baker here. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Thanks, Jason. Hey, I just wanted to offer, uh, I established a, a home in Lynn Ranch, Thousand Oaks area that has all of these components uh, under test for the last year and a half, um, including exterior rigid insulation, uh, one inch of uh, a cork on the exterior of the walls of the house all the way around, four mm -hmm. inches of Gutex on the roof, three quarter inch uh, air ventilation on the walls and the roof, uh, uh, Lunos air exchange system throughout the house. It's a raised foundation, 1963 build. So if anybody wants to take a look at the house, I'm more than happy to show anybody to touch and feel because it's a little different talking about it than seeing it. And I'm excited about it. My house doesn't vary more than three degrees up or down either way, no matter what the temperature is outside, as long as the windows are closed up, this house is thermally stable. It's quiet right now. I can't hear the wind outside. I'm looking at trees blowing. I can't hear anything coming in the house. So there are a lot of benefits to this and it's, it's real and it works. And uh, I'm happy to show it to anybody. So I just wanted to make that, uh, that offer available for a touch and feel session. If you want to come in, check out the attic with all the insulation, have lock wool up in the roof rafters, 
continuous air barrier on a raised foundation throughout the house. It's legit. It works. And uh, come on out. Love to show it to you. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. Uh, yeah. And what uh, what town are you in again? Did you say? Thousand Oaks, right near the Thousand, Thousand Oaks Mall. So technically Ventura yeah. County. You know, we've done some, uh, we did a, um, a live, um, it was a, a Zoom tour of the, that Bishop Passive House. And it was really a successful way to have people be able to Zoom, but you actually go through with your camera and show folks. So I'd be interested, maybe we can uh, make some arrangement to be able to, to tour the thing and um, be able to share it online. Yeah, it'd be interesting. I'd be happy to do anything that you guys are up for because it's uh, sometimes it's hard to comprehend until you see it and understand mm -hmm. it. And this right. one, and then, the, the one yeah. thing I wanted to I, that I shared in the, the chat was this idea of whatever siding you put on outside really has a bearing on how you set up that that furring strip and, and using construction screws into the studs. Otherwise, you might have some sagging on the walls if you bring in some very heavy, you know, James Hardy cement based siding, which is, you know, has offers some really nice fire resistant capabilities, but it's heavy as all get out. And if you start throwing up your siding and then you have some sagging going on at the same time, uh, you could kind of shoot yourself in the foot. That's that's one of the things I'd like to to caution that that could have been disastrous had we not used construction screws all the way through to the studs. Right. Super good point. And what Mike does um for that one that he uh, staples the Gutex in to hold it in place, right. then has the furring strips, and then absolutely that the siding goes all the way through the Gutex, the furring strip Gutex uh, into the stud. You're absolutely right. Thank you for pointing that out because that would be a miss. Yeah, I saw a couple of horror stories where they missed it, nailed it through the furring strips, and it started to fall down literally over Ugh, a short amount yeah. of time. So you can imagine uh, you finish a house and watch your siding kind of creep off the wall. That could be ugly. Yeah. Um, let's see. It, uh, you, you're also welcome to kind of unmute and, and chime in. Um, I know uh, Judy, uh, gosh, do we have two Judys on the line? Um, oh yeah. Uh, Judy Robertson, you had a couple of comments in here. Did you want to yeah. ask or comment? Sure, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Um, I, first, I wanted to say hi to Judy Rachel, who's the other Judy. <laughs> on the and I wanted to um, to just say what a great presentation this is all, all together in terms of graphics and, um, and descriptions. And um, I appreciate the fact that most of y'all uh, are coming from from a beyond the code kind of perspective, maybe passive house levels of performance, and I applaud that. Um, on the other hand, I work for the Energy Commission, and we're we're trying to just um, enforce the the basic energy code. And so um, I think that is um, that our Judy our the Judy's discussion about supply only ventilation kind of reflects that different perspective that um, balanced ventilation with heat recovery is the best systems that, system that money can buy. And it, you know, for those homes that are really tight enough uh, for a small fan like that to control the indoor or outdoor air exchange, it makes a lot of sense. But for uh, new homes, typically, typical new homes in California, including multifamily homes, uh, they're nowhere near tight enough for a balanced ventilation system to um, to have the heat recovery effect. In other words, the amount of air that is going through the system and the heat recovery core is overwhelmed by uncontrolled infiltration because the house isn't tight. So I just wanted, wanted to say um, to give that little perspective. Uh, gosh, thanks so much for Judy, uh, for those comments, Judy. I think that's really an important um, perspective. You're right. We are trying to share higher performance, but it's not applicable all the time and could be um, counterproductive, uh, as you say, if you're um, uh, putting so much investment into this kind of an HRV for a home that's, you know, leaky as it is. Yeah. Um, so, thanks. And so another just real quick to sum it up. 
um, people tend to think that they have builders, uh, production builders tend to think that they have a choice between balanced ventilation and exhaust, but actually there is a, another, um, the other option is standalone supply ventilation without heat recovery. And it provides the benefits of being able to choose where your air comes from, you know, where in the house it's coming from and pu pushing it through a filter. So in a way it's, I call it the better half of balanced ventilation because it provides some of the uh, advantages that are attributed to balanced ventilation really come from the supply side hmm. only. Great, yeah, we thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we talk a lot about that with our multifamily uh, clients, especially because we're also trying to help them get better performance across, you know, room to room, apartment to apartment. Oh, it's so much more important. Yeah, where the air comes from. Yeah, I was really, yeah. really pleased that that you're um, promoting or advocating floor door testing because. Um, that's not in the code yet. And so, when, right? When's that going to get in the code? <laughs> we know. <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. Nice to meet you. Okay, great. Super Thank you. Super great to meet you. Um, I can keep calling on people, or is there anybody else who wants to jump in? We. We've got we've got five more minutes, so we can be five here. more minutes. Uh, Judy, Rachel, did you want to jump in on this, or Dave Barnes? I know I'm looking now. I'm having a chance to look at the comments here. Um, um, hi, this is Charlie Offerman. I work with Judy. Um, hey, Charlie. Uh, just one thing, if you do have suggestions for the 2025 code. Um, the case team is looking for um, recommendations that are open on the Energy Code ACE website. So um, if there's stuff you want to see in there, um, door's still open, I think, until March. Something looking for um, public comment and input in terms of um, measures for the 2025 code. The blower door test. <laughs> That's the one you want, Jennifer? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm, and also, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's an energy code issue, but it seems like it sure would be nice to get rid of like seeing going to job sites and seeing a whole bunch of broken up bisqueen with sand sprinkled all over it underneath and top and then a slab poured because you're getting the moisture in the house you know sometimes potential floors are being ruined and stuff oh god um, um, um that, one well, would be a, that one would be a building code um, yeah yeah so really and, would be and there as you are well aware there's um legacy issues and involved in the industry <laughs> regarding <laughs> the sand beds We've always got it this way. <laughs> what? We've never heard that before. <laughs> uh, that's great. Oh, okay. Gosh. Well, I'm super any other glad you guys liked it. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, any other comments or questions that folks want to chime in on? Otherwise, we will wrap up and let you get on with your days. I just wanted to commend you guys for putting together a, a very simplified, quick presentation for a very complex topic. Uh, there are a lot of different facets to this. It took me years to kind of get on the, the horse and ride it. So great job. I, I, I think it, it gave a really good presentation quickly, but didn't go into ad nauseum on anything. So well done to all of you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks thank so you. much. That's, that's what we're trying to, that's what we're trying for. And, um, and we also, we um, especially, it looks like we'll be able to be uh, back in person in the coming months. So if you 
know of an organization, an AIA or builders group. Uh, you know, it's a roadshow that 3C Ren has been able to uh, support. So we're happy. We have a, a whole range of topics that we um, can uh, can present on. And your feedback's been really helpful. I, for sure, we'll update this presentation to be able to have more of that uh, supply side conversation, uh, supply only. I think that that um, that that's a gap that I think we should spend a little bit more time on. So thank you for that some insulation uh, advice. So some really good conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Guys. All right. We'll close it out and uh, have a good afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Everyone. Bye.